Does anybody know what I have here? Anybody know what these things are? You have a piece of wood. I do have a piece of wood. That's very astute, Ben. Thank you. What about what about these tools here? Idea? There's a sharp blade there. It's metal and wood. All right, well, these are called planes. All right, I got three kinds. This is a smoothing plane, and this is a bench plane, and this is a finger plane. This is a little bitty guy. And you use these to take the rough edges off of wood or to flatten wood, like this big guy right here. If you get a good handhold on this and you run it back and forth over a board, it'll make it nice and smooth. Have you ever set, been like outside and you've been cutting down logs or something with your yeah. parents and, and the wood's real rough and you can make it smooth with the smoothing plane? Now the bench plane, it can't quite do a big surface, but it can do sides like this. You can run that plane down. Whoops, and I don't want to kill anybody. Yeah, there you go. And see, it makes these nice wood shavings. And we can just smooth that guy down to whatever size and shape we want. And then this little finger plane, this lets us take the edges and we can do stuff. We can make, make it round. See, I'm kind of round on that edge right there. Like that. Or you can make it real flat, like if you wanted it to be at a 45 degree angle. And see how that one's kind of, now I got a 45 degree angle. So we can use these to shape the wood, can't we? Now, what does that remind you of? Does it guys remind you about anything? Um, is this sandpaper? It's well, it's a good guess. Maybe about a Bible story or something right. we talked about if you were here last week. Well, last week we talked about how Jesus, his ministry, he teaches us how we should live, right? How we should lead other people in our lives. And these tools, just like they shape the wood, when we study God's word and when we live out the principles that he has taught us, then that's, we're getting shaped. We're kind of like that wood, right, that he shapes, right? Mm -hmm. And if we are shapeable, then we can end up nice and smooth. And here, you guys can all, can you feel that? This one's already been planed down. See how smooth it is? there, how soft, it's almost soft, you know, although it's hard, and that's what we can be like in our lives if we will let God plane us and shape us, all right? Let's pray for a minute, and then we'll get into the, to the sermon. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for the lessons that you teach us. I pray that they would shape us and mold us so that we would be like this piece of wood here that's usable and ready for building. And we just thank you and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, good work, guys. Good work. We'll come up and clean our little wood mess up later. There's no children's church today. No children's church today, but we will have it the rest of the month. This is our family day. That's why I had a little bit of an illustration for us so we could get up out of our seats a little bit before I start talking a lot. So this week we continue on in part two of our leadership series as we start this new year. And if you weren't here, here's what you need to know. There are three things that we learned about Jesus, that after his birth that we celebrated at Christmas, he had a ministry where three things basically happened. First of all, he became completely right and ready for that ministry. And God shaped him through the experience through the, at the wilderness with Satan as he was tempted, and that prepared him then to cast vision and to share the gospel message, which in turn caused him to equip other leaders. So one, two, three. Those are the three things that we're really focusing on. And I really want us, in a few weeks, or now probably not months, but in a few weeks when we end this, I want us to really have a solid grip on exactly what that means and what our vision is that God has given us and the ministry that he's given us so that we will be like him. Because that's what it's all about. It's really all about him. It's about being like Jesus, doing what he did, saying the things that he said, and living our life like him so that we will be effective at making a difference for good in this world. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to Matthew chapter 5. That's where we're going to pick it up. We looked at chapter 4 last week, and we saw how Jesus went through the temptations in the wilderness. We saw how he called uh, Peter and, and some other of the uh, apostles, the disciples. And so he's got these guys all together, and he's, he's trying to teach them. He's trying to live out for them the things that they need to know. And then we find that this uh, time has passed, and we have this scene and this is probably a culmination of, of, a mul of several sermons that he preached on the hillside. All right, Or this could, he could have preached the same sermon over and over, and this is the one that he preached on the hillside. We don't know exactly, but we know that these are the things that he taught. And these are the things that are the, what I call the, the basics or the fundamentals for us as New Testament believers. And the reason that I say New Testament is because 
Jesus spent some time clarifying, really, what was in the Old Testament, but that had gotten mixed up. That the Jews had kind of created their own kind of version of what God's laws were, and he, he went through and systematically corrected those things in a culture that was shaped, really, at this point, by uh, Rome, by the Roman Empire. And so the Roman common law and, and the, the effects of that upon the Hellenistic culture and, and then the Jewish culture were all kind of culminating in this melting pot of, of things. And so Jesus finds himself in the midst of all of that, and he, he tries to straighten out and teach some things, not only to the crowds that were there, but to his uh, apostles, his disciples, so that they would be equipped and prepared for the gospel message as they spread out and as it moved away from just this small area uh, in biblical times. And of course, as we see it now in North America. So let's begin. Verse 1, when he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. And he said, and these are the Beatitudes, Blessed are the poor in spirit, because the kingdom of God is theirs. Blessed are those that mourn, because they will be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, because they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, because they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, because they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, because they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, because they will be called the sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, because the kingdom of God is theirs. And blessed are you when they insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice, because your reward is great in heaven. For that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. One of the things that we find about the Beatitudes is there's a lot of discussion about being persecuted. And there's a lot of different ways to be persecuted. We can be physically persecuted, emotionally uh, persecuted. We can just be left out. You know, people think, I hear, oh, yeah, he's a, he's a Christian. You know, don't say cuss words around him or you know, don't try to steal or lie around him or he'll, he'll rat you out to the boss. So there's a lot of different ways that we can be persecuted. And, and I've, I believe that there are many similarities between what the disciples found and the followers of Christ found during this particular time, in about you know, 30 AD-ish, 35, 40, they found that they were in a hostile culture, a culture that did not share their values. We saw a wonderful movie yesterday. It's called The Good Lie or A Good Lie. I can't remember. And it's a story about uh, a Christian uh, Sudanese family that uh, their, their parents were killed and slaughtered in, in the 80s during the, the war between North and South Sudan. And um, they, it was a story of their journey to a, um, a, a, see, what they, a refugee camp. I was going to say a settlement camp, but a refugee camp. And then after years and years of struggling and suffering and being near death many times, and many of the, their siblings died. They had started out with seven or eight brothers and sisters and only... Two actually made it, and then they had a, fr a friend that they called a brother and a friend they called a sister because of their shared faith and because they had endured all these trials together. And they finally made it then, like nine or ten years later, because they were, you know, seven, eight, nine years old when they ran. They probably crossed seven, eight hundred miles by themselves. I mean, just these little kids just trying to escape, you know, they're in, in part of it. And this is, this is a true story. Um, one of, several of them got killed by soldiers. Several of them uh, got killed by just natural means. That one of them got killed by a lion, because um, of course they're going right through the raw jungle. I mean, it's just it's a really tearful and and tragic in in some sense story. But it ends with several of them surviving. They come to America. Um, three of them come to Kansas City, Missouri, actually, and then one of them goes to Boston. The sister, which they get reunited later on, and it's a wonderful story of of the contrast between how we ought to live as Christians and how we ought to be as the, the church of Christ or as, as the people of Christ and how we really are. And you really see that, and, and, and Reese Witherspoon is in it. She does a great job with her character kind of demonstrating a stereotypical American and our culture and how it contrasts with what we see here in the New Testament. And so I strongly recommend it uh, for, for you guys to see. It's just a great, great movie with a powerful message. And so in this culture of persecution, then, there are certain attributes that he calls out here that I think are significant. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are those that are gentle, those that hunger and thirst for righteousness, those that are merciful. 
because these are the qualities that, that were few and far between, and that are few and far between, even in our own culture. I mean, think about it. Is that how you would describe your friends at school, your coworkers? Are, those, are these words that you would use to describe them? How about you? Are these words that they would use to describe you? You see how challenging it is to be these things, to show mercy when people wrong us, when we're treated unfairly, to be able to be humble and willing to let others ex experience the good things that we might allow ourselves to go without for a time. In fact, there was a, a scene in this that really stands out in my mind that one of these... Um, these boys that he's now like 20, 19 or 20, and he's working in this grocery store. And of course, after spending his whole life just literally near starvation, he, his, his boss or his, the store owner tells him to take these huge carts of food out to the dumpster. And so he's you know, obviously just shocked out of his mind, like just in unbelief that he's going to throw out this food. And so he challenges his boss, says, hey, you know, can't, isn't there somebody who could have this food? He says, well, if they knew they could get it for free, they wouldn't come buy it. I'm a businessman, and you know, yada, yada. And it just really, it really broke my heart because it, it was a great picture of how we can be sometimes, how we can harden our hearts and we say, well, it's because of this or because of that. It's because of uh, you know, the way that, that our culture is. And, and we end up doing things that are very contrary to the gospel, and we don't, ex we don't exude these characteristics, these behaviors. But Jesus said, for those that are followers of Christ, that we are to, to demonstrate these things in our life. And then, in fact, he, he creates several very interesting um, examples. And the first one is found, in, as we continue on here in verse 13, where he talks about salt and light. And incidentally, we, we have two small groups that have these same uh, names, just you know, for the coolness factor of that, although they mean different things. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt should lose its taste, how can it be made salty? It's no longer good for anything, to be, to, but to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill can't be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand, so that it gives light for all those that are in the house. And in the same way, let, let your light shine before men, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. All right, so both of these are illustrations that we may not fully deal with on, our, on a daily basis. If you lived in 35 AD, you would deal with these things all the time because you would be packing what little meat you had with salt because it was a preservative. It kept the meat from rotting. All right, That's the significance of that. So if we are the salt, we are that preservative. We are what keeps the culture from rotting, from going, you know, quote, unquote, to hell in a handbasket. And so the other illustration here of being light, you know, we just flip the light switch, the lights come on, you know, or in this room it's particularly complicated and there's many, many switches and many buttons on the computer screen to make the lights come on all in different intensities and colors. But at this point, you, you had very simple lighting and, and because it was so expensive, because you're either burning some kind of oil or you're burning, you know, something that costs money to, or that you have to work hard to reproduce using animal lard and, and different things like for candles, you would try to situate that light so that in your house or outside of your house, whatever you're trying to illuminate, you would get the maximum benefit for that light. Now, that's not a big deal for us, and we stick our lights all up in canisters and the ceiling and do all kinds of accent lighting because, you know, by and large, energy is cheap, you know, compared to how it's been in the past. And you may not feel like that when you get your gas bill in the winter, and so I, I get that. I just got mine this, this last month. Uh, although it's better than it's been several years ago before some of the new technologies that have come out. But that light is something that is and was cherished, and, and it had to be used in just the right way so that it would shine and it would illuminate the house, just like we have to, to prepare ourselves and put ourselves in the right place so that God can use us and so that we can be that light that is shining in the darkness of the world. And that's really the emphasis that we're on. I, I really would like, and I, I believe that the Lord has put it on my heart, for us to take each of these three things that Jesus did uh, and, and emulate them and really study them and, and dig deep into um, the, the Gospels to understand how he accomplished these things, how he lived by the Spirit, how he, he emptied himself of, of the flesh because he was a very physical person in, in many ways, and he let the, the Spirit, his, his supernatural God awesomeness part, control his life, which 
even though we're not God and we don't have that supernatural awesomeness, it's, that's the same way that we're to live, that we are to empty ourselves of the flesh, of those things that cause us to be selfish and angry and jealous and so on and so forth, and, and fill ourselves with, with all of these things, the things that cause us to be meek, to be gentle, to be giving and merciful to the people that are around us. So then in verse 17, it says, Don't assume that I have come to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. And that was one of the big accusations of Jesus, all right? Um, sometimes we think, oh, you know, he was this great teacher, and nobody ever disputed or countered that. But he always had people with him, particularly the Pharisees and the Sadducees, that criticized everything he did. And they followed him around. They, they tried to come up with ways to trap him because they were jealous. They didn't like the, the fame that, that he had uh, garnered around him. He didn't, they didn't like people going out and traveling, uh, you know, and going walking miles and miles and miles to hear him speak. They didn't like that. They wanted them to come to the synagogue and listen to their amazing teaching, and, and they were very jealous. And so they were constantly trying to ridicule, ridicule him and create problems. So Jesus deals specifically with those accusations, and that's why he said, I'm, I've not come here to, to do away with the law, or in our case, what we would consider the Old Testament. He was talking about the Torah, which is the first books of, that, uh, of the Old Testament. And that's why I think it's important that we, we do not throw those things out as well. And there are some faiths, there are some um, uh, cults and or slash denominations that only teach from the New Testament, or they only, you know, they just completely wipe away the Old Covenant. And really, they're one and the same, if you, if you look at them from a, uh, a macro view and you examine God's work and what he's trying to accomplish, they're really the same. The difference is the way that God deals with us, the change in covenants between there being a law and a, a covenant where, where we were given a, a standard that was unachievable, and God had mercy on us, and now in the new covenant, he has given us a way through Christ to be able to achieve that righteousness with God's help. And so he says, I've not come to destroy the law or the prophets, but I've come to fulfill them. Going on in verse 18, For I assure you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all these things are accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches people to do so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Now, let's just stop and think about that for a minute. When I think about that, I think, well, if I get up on Sunday or if I'm, I'm teaching a Sunday school class or a Bible study and I teach something, some heresy, then I'm going to be considered the least in the kingdom of heaven. Okay, which is true, right? That, that is certainly a true thing. That, that is not good to teach falsely. And, then, and unfortunately, there's a lot of that in our culture. But if I live my life a certain way, Let's say that I come to church and I say, hey, I'm a Christian, and I say all the cool words like sanctification and trinity and, you know, all those kind of cool words. I even speak a little Greek, you know, ichthus and whatever from here and now and then. But then I go to work and I live my life and I'm a liar, I'm a cheater, I'm selfish. What have I done? I've taught falsely, haven't I? I've taught falsely because I said I was one thing, but I've demonstrated with my actions that I'm another thing. All right? And that's a good thing for you kids to, to really think about. Not just what you say, who you are at school, which that's bold and that's awesome. If you go to school and say, hey, I'm a Christian, that's great. But if you live that out, then that is one greater than even speaking those, those words. And then Jesus says, he says, um, For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is basically saying, unless you're perfect, then you need me. You need my redemption. And then he goes right into a teaching on murder, adultery, divorce, telling the truth, loving your neighbor, and the list goes on. We're going to get through all of those today. But he began to, to go systematically and to draw the contrast between how our flesh wants to live but how we ought to live. And that's tough. And I think, you know, for us parents, the easiest way for me to really think about this, this paradigm is we, we see it in our kids, right? We say to our children, for example, and if, if I've said this probably one time or my wife, it's, I've said it many hundreds of thousands or millions of times, clean your room, 
All right? Raise your hand if you're a parent and you've ever made this statement. Okay, that's pretty much every parent. All right. Now, I don't know what it is. There's like this amazing um, dark force that prevents my children from, well, except for one. David's room is always clean. But for everyone else, uh, and has since he was like six, for everyone else, their room is seldom to never clean. Although my children are all wonderful, but cleaning their rooms is not their strongest spiritual attribute. So what happens, you know, when, when I say clean your room or when I get threatening and I say, okay, if you want to eat dinner, clean your room. If you want to have this privilege, clean your room. If you want to play World of Warcraft, if you want to watch whatever, clean your room. Okay. But then, ultimately, what happens? You come, you stroll by the room an hour later. What's happening? Well, somehow that toy that they picked up, it's now kind of become, oh, I'm playing with the toy but it's like it takes them, you know, 10 minutes to walk it to its final destination or it never gets there. So there, there's this, this thing that comes up somehow that, that distracts our children from accomplishing the good task that we've set before them, right? And, and here's the thing, parents. We have the same exact problem. We have the same exact problem, right? God has given us, he's our father, he has given us this task, this good spiritual task, just like Having our children clean their room is a good thing because it teaches self-control, it teaches discipline, it teaches stewardship, taking care of the toys and the clothes and the things that God's entrusted to us. So all those good things. But so also God has given us that same task. And what do we do? Well, we get up to go after that. But then along the way we're like, oh, well, man, I really like that new car, that new phone. I really to go on vacation, yeah, I don't want to work right now, and so all of a sudden we just, we get distracted, don't we? Just like our kids, when they're carrying that toy to go put it away, and they're like, uh, I think I'll play with this for just a little bit. Or they, they maybe kind of take the, the, the cheating way out, and they stick it under their bed, or they stick it, you know, they find this place, like, okay, like somehow, you know, even though my wife is like the, the under the bed checking machine, you know, I mean, my kids should know by now that if they stick something on the bed, that's the first place she's going to look for that thing. But still, what happens? Stuff just goes under the bed, right, or under the dresser or wherever that spot is because it's so much easier to do that. So what does it look like? Well, okay, God's called me to be a Christian, so, um, all right, okay, yeah, I don't really feel like telling my friends at work about Christ. Yeah, that's too hard. I don't want to go on a mission trip, but that's too hard. Um, I don't think I really want to change who I am because that's really hard. And I don't want to, you know, and so it's like, well, okay, I will, I tell you what I'll do. I'm going to, God, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to go to small group this week. That's what I'm going to do. So show up, go to small group, sit there, smile, yes, answer all the questions, Jesus, God, salvation, and then boom, you walk away. Ooh, I'm a Christian. I'm good. Went to small group. Look at me. Oh, yes, I am awesome. Now, going to small group is really good, so don't hear me downing that. But that should be a, the fir- that should be a first step, not a, Final, ooh, boom, I'm living the Christian life. All right, so, so one of the things that, that Jesus is very clear about here is this is something that we do all the time. This isn't something we just do at church, at small group, at the fellowship, at the whatever, but this is something that we do every day. This, is, this becomes who we are. It becomes a part of our essence of, of, of who Jonathan House is, of who Kristen Riffle is, of who Jimmy Stackpole is. It becomes who we are. And so everything that, that we choose, everything that we do in our life, it is a reflection of what Christ has taught us, of how he's shaped us, just like with the planes over here. When we plane that wood and we shape that wood, and he's smoothing, he's working on us, and he's shaving off those rough spots, those things that are not good. He's shaving those things off, and that should be apparent. We should see those things in our lives so that in 2015, we're more patient than we were in 2014. We're more faithful in our church attendance. We're more faithful being on mission and sharing truth. We're more faithful just all around in all the things that God has set before us. Let's talk about murder. Murder begins in the heart. Verse 21. You have heard that it was said to our ancestors, do not murder. And whoever murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you this, everyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. And whoever says to his brother fool will be subject to the Sanhedrin. And whoever says, in this translation, you moron, uh, or there's a Hebrew word that a lot of times is in the, in the King James, you'll be subject to hellfire. So let's talk about that for a minute. 
We talked about the, the room cleaning illustration and with the kids sticking stuff under the bed. This is a perfect example of what happens right here. God says, don't murder. So, okay, I won't pick up my gun or my knife or whatever and kill someone. And boom, I'm righteous. Boom, I'm not a murderer. And that's what was happening. But what did Jesus say? If you get angry and you call your brother an idiot or the S word, stupid, which we don't speak in our house, well, at least we're not supposed to speak, then you're okay. The problem is that God says if you, if you do that, if you call them those, those things, it's just like you killed them. If you become angry with them, bam, you are a murderer. Well, that's a pretty big difference. Because on the one hand, we're thinking, hey, I'm good, I'm righteous. You got all these religious leaders and people, and they're standing proud, getting the purple ink going on their cool shawls, and doing all the prayer stuff, going to the wailing wall, and oh God, thank you that I'm not like this wretched sinner over here. Thinking that they are righteous, thinking that we are righteous, where, guys, I, I tell you what, some of us are walking time bombs. You know, somebody does something to us, and it just sets us off, and man, boom, we're in anger mode, or we're trying to get even, or we're, we bury it down deep, and we get mad, and man, it, I tell you what, it, that's got to change. I mean, how many, how many church splits have happened because somebody made somebody else mad, and then it just got out of control from there? A lot. A lot. And guys, that does not bring glory to God at all. And we're all guilty. We're all guilty. There's not one of us in here that has not uttered a word in anger to our family, to our friends. And so we have to recognize that God has given us a, a spirit of peace. He's given us a spirit of love. And if we choose to reject that and let the flesh be in control, then we're going to just ooze out these bad things. And we can get pretty big on our high horse and shake our finger at our kids and say, well, you... You, know, you shouldn't stick this sock here. You shouldn't stick this underwear here. You shouldn't, you know. But we do the same thing in our lives. We're trying to take shortcuts. We're trying to cheat God and then say, ooh, I'm righteous, I'm good, when really we're murderers. So what does God say in verse 23? He said, so if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar and go be reconciled to him and come and offer your gift. Right? So what does that mean for us? Because back then, you know, they had these rituals and you'd make sacrifices. For us, that's worship. That's when we come, and it doesn't necessarily have to be on Sunday, but whenever we come to worship God, corporately or otherwise, and there's, we know that our brother has something against us or we have something against them, or sister, yeah, don't try to get out of that, ladies, cause just because it says brother, then we have a problem. Because God says, you can't really worship me. You cannot really worship me and have anger in your heart and unforgiveness in your heart. So now how many of you guys are going to, I don't see a whole lot of people walking out the door and going to fix whatever it is before they stand there and sing. I just see us all, we just stand up because Annette says stand up and start singing and oh, praise you God, you're awesome, you know, God is exalted, blah, 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 when all the time we have something against a brother or sister. And so there is a contrast, and I, I hate it when that happens. I hate it when there is a contrast between what God says I need to do and what I'm actually doing. I hate that. It's just as annoying as being the child who is standing there and you stuck that sock under the bed and your parent busts you for it. And you're like, oh, man. It's the worst feeling. I can remember that as a kid. I can remember sticking my socks where they shouldn't go and getting busted for it. And I hate that feeling because I thought, man, I can, I'm going to get away with it. They're going to think that I'm a great room cleaner and I'm going to cheat them and I'm going to fool them into thinking that I'm better than I am. And I'm afraid that's what we do in church. In verse 25, it says, Reach a settlement quickly with your adversary while you're on the way with him. Or your adversary will hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer, and you will be thrown into prison. And I assure you, you will never get out of there until you've paid the last penny. So what I think is fascinating here is that God gives a reason. Now, I like that. You know, when I was a kid and my parents said, Don't do this or do this, it would frustrate, frustrate me a little bit when they wouldn't give me a reason. Are there any children here that have experienced the same frustration? Oh, just one. Oh, two, three, four, okay, several. All right, now, here's the thing. Do our parents owe us an explanation? No. The Bible says obey your parents, period. Not obey your parents if they give you a really good reason, 
well, although it might be kind of good when I was in your space if it said that, but now that I'm a parent, I really would not like that clause, which it doesn't exist anyway, okay? We just made that up. It just says obey your parents, but it's nice when you get a reason. It is nice because then you know, and so God gives us a reason. He says so that you don't end up getting yourself in a whole lot of trouble, going to jail or owing a lot of money. So in other words, we need to work things out with people, guys. All this going to court and suing each other and yelling at each other and not speaking to each other for 10 years, that is nonsense. That is ridiculous. That is completely opposite of how God wants us to live. When we have a problem with somebody, we've got to go to that person immediately and fix it. And we've got to be ready to forgive. We've got to be ready to show mercy. Man, and that is so hard. I know, that, I know that's hard. But we've got to do that. If we're going to be salt and light, we have got to be faithful to do that. That is how unity in the church happens. That is how churches grow and are healthy and continue to be healthy. Is by us fixing these things. When, when we have a problem, we fix it. You're going to have, we're going to have differences of opinion. We're all different. Every one of us. You're going to have differences of opinion with your boss, your parents, and your kids, and so on and so forth. There's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't matter at all. It's not bad to have a difference of opinion. But to have a conflict happen and not reconcile it is a sin. In fact, God says you're a murderer. If you're angry with your brother, then you need to go and make it right. And we need to do that. Let's look at this last section, and then we're going we're gonna to quit for today. Adultery in the heart, verse 27. You've heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery in his heart. All right, so just like the murdering thing, another challenging thing. You might say, well, I've never had an affair. I've never, you know, had an inappropriate relationship with another woman. So I must be great. I must be a perfect and faithful husband or wife. But what does the Bible say? If we look upon a woman or... If you're a woman, you look upon a man. Or if you're a man and so on and so forth. You kind of get where I'm going with that. Then you have committed adultery in your heart. So again, it's the cheating thing. We try to cheat ourselves and say, well, it's okay to view pornography. It's okay to, to look at this or to do that or to, to daydream about this coworker because I'm not acting on it. But God says, no, it begins right here. That sin begins right here. The seed of that begins right here. Now, in the Bible says, and we see a lot, the heart. It says the heart. But we've learned from medical technology that our heart doesn't think for us. Our mind does. All right? So a lot of times when we see that, we have to you know, think that. But there's kind of this, I think, this metaphysical um, meaning with the heart. Because there, we, we, have a, we all have a soul. We all have, uh, there is this spiritual realm that is somewhat of a mystery to us. And so there are more things that work. So I think it's too simple if we just say the mind. And we say, oh, well, then it's a, it's a sociological issue. It's a psychological issue. So now we go get counseling, and then we do that for 10 years, and we're not any better, and we wonder why. And that's because it's more than just that. So it's more than just here. But it, it begins here. It begins in our mind with our thoughts. And it begins with how we place ourselves. Um, I'm very clear with uh, our co-pastors and staff and, and leaders that we are to avoid putting ourselves in a, in a situation where we are tempted to sin. So that means you will never find me alone with another woman. It's just not going to happen. You're just not going to find that. Uh, you won't find me talking or discussing about something with a woman that, that might be borderline inappropriate without her husband there or kids or somebody else there. And these are, aren't rules just for leaders. These are rules should we, we should all live by. That there are places that we can put ourselves in. And I know it's hard sometimes. Sometimes in a work situation, you know, it can be, it can be tough to avoid those situations. There are, there are some exceptions. I understand that. But as a rule, we, we need to place ourselves in a situation where we will not fail. Because, um, and for those of you who've experienced adolescence, and you're a little bit past that, like Joelle, and you've gotten into the 30s, you know, like my mom and my dad, and you know, Patty and Randy, who's not here, he's sick today. You know, some of you that experience, you know, just slightly past the teenage years, you know that it's easier said than done. It's easier said than done. That we have to be intentional, we have to go out of our way to make sure that we're not putting ourselves in a place where we're going to fail. So for some of us men, that means us and unfiltered, uncensored internet and being alone just shouldn't happen. It just should never happen. If we don't have the self-control to not view things that we shouldn't be viewing, we just got to cut that off. In fact, what's interesting here, 
Look at right here at verse 29. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. Well, that's a little intense, and that's probably a little PG-13. For it's better that you lose... It kind of makes me think zombie apocalypse a little bit, actually. That you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. In fact, I think in the Orient, they actually did that for a long time. I don't think they still do, but if you are caught stealing, they cut your hand off. For it's better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. So that's kind of extreme, but it makes the point that it's a choice. We have the choice. It's, it's not like we're just kind of walking along and, you know, bam, you know, temptation happened to us, which temptation is going to happen, but us acting on it, on it is up to us. And so we have to be wise and shrewd to not place ourselves in a situation where we are going to fail. Jeff mentioned that um, it's kind of a cultural thing that, that when in the New Year starts, we, we set New Year's resolutions. Um, I don't think that's a bad thing, necessarily. Uh, I do think it's kind of humorous that, that people that, you know, are going to work out or whatever, and then they fail, like by the time the third week of January comes along. Not so impressive. But I believe that New Year's, July, November, it's always a good time to make change, to start fresh. And I think 2015 is a great year to start fresh. Um, you know, there are a lot of problems in the world, but it could be a lot worse. A hundred years ago today, we were entering the second year of the Great War, of World War I. Bad year. Bad year, for sure. We have a lot to be thankful for. And there are a few of you that, that are kind of riding the fence, that you're just kind of, well, yeah, God's at work in my life. He's important. But there's other stuff. It's going on in my life, too. And you're kind of riding the fence. You've got one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom. And I want to challenge you that, that, to, that perhaps this year, this is an opportunity for you to draw a line in the sand and say, okay, things are going to really be different this year. Not just like for three weeks until you get to the third week of January and it gets too hard and you quit. But to say, you know what, I've, I've just, you know, this year I think it's time for me to get serious about my faith. It's time for me to get serious about God, who he is, what it means for me, and it's time for me to start making a difference in the world. And you know, Satan is a great big liar, and he says, yeah, you'll never do anything to make a difference. Guys, I'm telling you what, this church exists because somebody somewhere decided, man, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a difference. Four years ago, there was no life journey church. But each of you, as you've come, you said, I want to make a difference. You've invited your friends, you've invited coworkers, you've brought others. God's been at work transforming all of us, changing all of us, teaching all of us how to live, how to love. And that can stop. We can all just get comfortable and say, well, yeah, I'm kind of done with that. And let other things in life distract us and pull us away. And it happens to me too. I mean, I get distracted all the time. You know, Satan will send something to kind of get my focus off, and I've got to just keep reorienting myself. But perhaps this year would be the year where you said, you know what, I'm going to, God's going to be real in my life. I'm tired of being a hypocrite. I'm tired of my life not really meaning anything or coming to bearing any fruit. And this year, somebody's life is going to be changed because of me. You know, the Bible says that God's word never returns void. So what does that mean? That means if we're speaking that word with our lives and with our mouths, that there will be life change in the people around us. There will be. It's a promise. Why don't you test that? Why don't you test God and see if that isn't true? But the, ca the key is, just like with murder, just like with adultery, we have to make decisions that put us in the right place to be used by God. And I'm asking you, I'm challenging you today, to make a decision to do that. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your everlasting kindness. That no matter how much wrong we've done, no matter, how, no matter how terrible things that have come out of our mouths, things that we've done, you have shown us forgiveness, you've shown us mercy, just like you've taught us to show. You've given us a second and a third and a fourth.
many, many more chances. And God, I thank you for that. Lord, as we begin this new year and as we examine you personally, the life that you lived, the things that you taught, how you trained up your disciples to be world shakers and changers. God, I pray that you would involve us in that. God, that we wouldn't just be another group of people in another building on another street corner, but that we would be a force in Ozark, Springfield, Nixa, Sparta, everywhere that we live. And it may take time, it may take a lot of hard work, but that people would continue to be changed and that that change would escalate and that your light would shine in the darkness of Southwest Missouri and Ukraine and Suriname and Hawaii and all the places that you send us away from here. God, I pray that you would give us hearts and, that can hear, that are humble, that are ready to be changed, to be shaped, that we wouldn't be stubborn, but that we would just be plain down and smooth down so that we can be used by you. God, I thank you for all, for every person in this room, for every child. God, I pray that your blessing would go with us as we seek to accomplish your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys so much. It's good to see those of you that have been missing from us. Uh, hope that uh, you all have a fantastic week. Uh, I know it's going to be a challenge as kids go back to school and things kind of get crazy again, but just remember that God is with you and he can accomplish great things through you.